Okay, so um, next up we're gonna have an engaging overview that's going to be lightning round, 10 minutes each of AI use cases. So the AI use cases are gonna be from the perspective of uh, hyperscalers. So first up, Vikram is going to talk on behalf of Google and present a view of use cases, then Manoj from Meta, and then Alex from Microsoft. So with that, uh, Vikram will take it away. And let's save questions till the end of the three talks, and then they can answer them together. Take it away. Yeah. Not working. Oh, perfect, hello. Hey everyone, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Vikram. I'm a director for product management at Google, where I focus on machine learning efficiency and uh, ways to scale. Uh, so I have a few things I want to chat about today, generally about uh, how you know, AI is helping uh, transform our use cases from foundation models uh, to uh, open frameworks and uh, open ecosystems. Uh, so the first thing, of course, you know, I think everyone here is already aware, and I suspect this is why everyone here is also here, is because generative AI is really transforming the way we think about uh, technology. And even at Google, for instance, uh, we just have a small number of models, for instance, you know, Palm, Kodi, Imogen, and what have you, which are driving a number of use cases, immense diversity of use cases, everything from consumer grade, BARD, and things like that, all the way up to enterprise grade and things like Vertex, uh, which is pretty astonishing. And you know, this brings me to the point, which I think Amir also kind of hinted at, which is that you know, foundation models are really the engine that are driving all these use cases. But that begs the question, what exactly do I mean by a foundation model? And you know, there are many definitions, here's one of them, which is a foundation model is a single, very large pre-trained model that serves as the foundation and, uh, for a number of use cases. So you can serve a multi multitude of use cases uh, with a single model just by fine tuning it for your specific need. And so this one model multiple uses paradigm is incredibly powerful, as you can imagine, because you don't need to retrain things from scratch. You start with a platform that's really good, and then you just build on top of it. And so this is how customers around the world can benefit from, you know, by fine tuning things to their specific needs. Uh, so what does this look like? So let me give you a few use cases which I think are very cool. The first is coding. Uh, so for instance, I can just tell the AI, like, please write for me a quick sort algorithm, and it does. You know, this used to be a you know interview question and what have you, no longer. Uh, now you can just, you know, developers can focus on what's really difficult, and the simple modules such as QuickSort, they can just leave it to the AI to figure out, right? Very, very cool. Uh, another one is uh, speech to text, text to speech. I actually find this, I don't know if folks can actually read the text here, which I find very amusing. Uh, so for instance, you can look at the foundation model output for a speech to text, and it's very clear, looking at the context that this is, you know, it has to do with air traffic controllers, it has to do with the plane, it's asking for instructions, and uh, it's very, very clear, because uh, the foundation model genuinely understands the context of the conversation. Whereas if you look at something more old school, I mean, you can see that the words phonetically sound like what the person may have been saying, but it makes no sense, right? It's like, well, what does this even mean, right? So, so this is the power of foundation models where you can begin to understand the context of these conversations and, and do much more with it. Now, um, I mentioned a little earlier that uh, you can do a lot of use cases using foundation models. So how can customers and users actually go about fine tuning this for their needs? And there's a broad spectrum of ways to do it, all the way from the simplest and cheapest, where you literally take this model off the shelf, do something called prompt engineering, which is very low key. You don't mess around with the main model, the main model remains intact. The benefit of this is it's very quick, very cheap. The downside is it may not be the highest quality. So the other end of the spectrum, you have you know, full fine tuning. You, know, you basically do reinforcement learning with human feedback. In this situation, you provide a lot of your data, and you completely change the way that the model is created, so the weights change. Uh, so the other end of the spectrum, lots of quality, very expensive. And in the middle, of course, you have rest of both worlds, where you have something uh, called adapter tuning, where you provide a little bit of uh, extra layer on top of a, a frozen model to uh, improve it for your particular use case. But the TLDR of all of this is that uh, there are many ways in which customers and users around the world can improve this model for their specific use case. OK, so that's one part of it, the foundation models. The other thing that has really transformed the way we think about AI use cases is open frameworks. So I think folks are very familiar with the with the, with the set, you know, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, Jax, and so on. So let me walk you through a few use cases that have really been transformed uh, with a very classic one, which is image classification, which is, okay, here's an image. Is it a cat or a dog? Now, this used to be a very, very complicated, painful, 100-plus line piece of code. Let me show you what it looks like now. 
So you start with something that is pre-built. Like, hey, I would like to start with a pre-existing data set, a preset model, which is ResNet 15 in this case. I have two classes, dog, cat. I have a data set which I bring with me. Fit, done. This is the whole piece of code, right? And the ability to do something this easily uh, means that developers, as I said earlier, can focus on the next order of cool things to work on, right? When, when something that used to take hundreds of lines takes only like, you know, 12, well, okay, I can spend this time on something even cooler now. Another great example is uh, text classification. So let's say that uh, I have a number of movie reviews. I'm trying to infer sentiment. You know, is this a good movie or a bad movie? Just looking at the reviews. So the way I do this is I start with something called a BERT classifier. I basically specify a number of classes, so good movie, bad movie. I, in this case, have a data set, which happens to be the IMDb movie data set. I just, and then based on, based on the simple lines of code, I'm able to predict based on you know, very simple statements whether the movie is good or not. So what an amazing movie. Okay, clearly, the, you know, as you can see from here, 1.0 on the right, that means really good. You know, total waste of my time, yep, really bad. Okay, so, so very simple to do. Uh, and we can extrapolate this even further. So let's say that I wanted to now help, have AI help me write uh, a story. You know, actually this is the most uh, canonical use case that folks are familiar with, which is truly generative AI. I want to complete the story. So how does that work? In this case, I start with a GPT-2 uh, preset. I have, in this case, a newspaper data set which has a lot of English language words, so it understands how sentences are created. And just with this, I'm able to basically start generating model code where I say, hey, I love peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but I, and you let the model complete it, and it does. You know, it auto-completes based on what's seen, and I like French fries even more. So again, this is a way in which, you know, if you were an author, you're able to use uh, things like AI to enhance your productivity and get more out of the system. Okay, and then now moving on to open ecosystem. So, as I said, there's an immense amount of creativity and awesomeness happening here. But one of the challenges we face when it comes to scaling is there's a lot of uh, you know, infrastructure, different kinds of infrastructure, lots of frameworks, lots of stacks. So we need a way to make this a more tractable problem. And this is where the open ecosystems really comes in. The first of which is OpenXLA. This is an open source compiler ecosystem created by a number of AI luminaries across the world, uh, you know, Google, AWS, many others have been part of this. And the intent of this is to provide a way for developers to compile and optimize their code across a number of frameworks and across a number of hardware. So they, basically we want developers to not think about the permutations of uh, things such as hardware and frameworks, but rather the outcomes that they're trying to drive. So you need something like an open XLA here. Another example is open FP, uh, OFP8 uh, uh, interchange format. You know, again, as I noted, there's so much, so many different pieces of hardware, so many different uh, stacks that exist. If you needed every permutation to be able to speak together to each other, it would be very difficult and intractable problem. So one of the ways in which you can enable interoperability is through this interchange format, where now you know different floating point representations can actually speak to each other through this uh, through this interchange format, which makes this a very well, not very much of a tractable problem. And then finally, the call to action, which I've kind of been hinting at all this time, is that you know, scaling is really the need of the hour. Um, we can do so much more, but it becomes increasingly expensive, increasingly power hungry, increasingly inefficient. So what is it that we, that we can do to enable this creativity to continue unbounded? You know, what are the ways in which, for instance, we can reduce the you know, silent data corruption? This is something that you don't actually see at small scale, or you don't care much about at small scale. But as the, the scales get larger and larger, it becomes an increasingly hard problem. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Manoj. Thank you. Okay, looks like this one is working. Um, so what I'm going to do now for the next section is basically slightly different angle. I'm going to start with the AI as a what overall use cases that we have, and then try to dig into what exactly it translates from a hardware perspective, the challenges, and then perhaps we'll see what we can do because as uh, was said in the previous sections, I think the AI is going to present a lot of problems to us. It's to OCP to figure out how to create a creative solutions for addressing those. So I'll start from there. Um, so first of all, I think I'm going to skip through some of these. Basically, AI use case at a high level, you're going to talk about problems. You're going to, you're going to train your models. You have to search the database to find out inference, basically, to figure out what the solutions are. And as we talked about in the previous one, Gen AI kind of solutions, which is synthesis, you're creating stuff that is not trained, but you're creating something based out of the training. Um, 
at a high level, if you see from AI data center perspective, the use cases, the one that actually drives our hardware, uh, would be something in the ranking and recommendations, or where you're trying to make a recommendation for um, more than three billion active users Facebook has about what content they should be looking at, what kind of movies or what kind of reels they're going to look at. We have computer vision, and then we have various language that we talked about from Genia perspective or Llama perspective or JetGPT, all the stuff that we are using. So at a high level, if you think of it, uh, for Meta, we, we have these main two use cases. One is, as we talked about, ranking and recommendation. This is where bulk of work happens from the deep learning recommendation model perspective. Uh, for this, you need hardware that is being trained and, uh, and then inference that actually will make the actual recommendation as, we, uh, as the users are working on it or looking at it. And then we have the Llama 2 kind of a large language models. Uh, this is where you have the training and inference, and inference you can consider into the two stages again, where you can do the first token, which is the first recommendation part that is coming out of the inference of Gen AI, which is called prefill, and then you keep on getting the, as we say, you know, I like peanut butter and jelly, but then you talk about, okay, but I like fries, right? Okay, the fries parts, the whole sentence completion comes into the decode part of it. Now I'm going to step back and say, okay, what problems do we have? As we see, this is something that you may have seen it many times. This is a very well-known paper that was AI and memory ball. From there, if you see, uh, what drives the systems is basically how fast your models are running and how large the models are, how many parameters it is being trained on. So if you look at basically how the models are growing, the number of parameters, the way they grow versus how much memory the accelerators have to work with. And you can see that actually the, definitely we are uh, moving into the place where you're going to go start getting constrained on capacity of the memory that the GPUs have or the accelerators have. Similarly, processing perspective. Uh, as we continue to process more, uh, are you able to maintain the amount of bandwidth that you need to get? I'm taking example of memory because I'll focus on one aspect in this presentation. But the same thing applies for the networking and other aspects of those things. Uh, so you, as you can see that uh, on the right hand side, the second chart, this is the teraflops on the uh, x-axis and then what we have is basically the y-axis shows the how the various interconnects are growing. Uh, this focuses on the, again me, uh, memory on the green arrow but there are a lot of other interconnects behind it which are also networking interconnects. So what this shows is that the bandwidth is also not keeping up as we see the uh, scaling of the models and the capabilities for the GPUs. So overall there is going to be a challenge from capacity and a bandwidth as we continue to scale for the larger and larger models to enable the kind of cool use cases that we talked about. So if you, if you think from, okay, wait. Okay, so we, when we talk about designing hardware, we are trying to optimize, we are solving this n-dimensional problem for various components that sit into the system, whether it is a compute, whether if I'm adding memory, uh, when I talk about compute, by the way, this compute is from the perspective of accelerator or CPU both, whatever computation capability you have. How much memory do we add? Uh, what kind of bandwidth we have? Uh, what are we trying to train the model for? What is the model size? What is the cluster scale? How many GPUs or accelerators do you need? And when we think of this and then start ma mapping them back into the uh, various use cases we talked about. If you have ranking and rec the recommendation models, we have training and inference. For large language models, we have training and we have prefill and decode, which is a part of inference. What this chart is trying to say, uh, without really going to the specific numbers of it, this is a significant problem that we see that different types of use cases push the limits of uh, different components on the systems, whether we may be bound on a memory one use cases, but it may be networking latency on the other side as we start going to the scale out. And the challenge for most of the systems that we're going to design into data center for addressing these AI needs for future, uh, um, is going to make sure that you know, we have a solutions for that because it may be difficult to have a very focused solution only for one of them unless it hits the scale that we expect it to uh, justify. So with that, let me focus back into the memory in EI system. So um, we saw different use cases and what the challenges will come from the uh, uh, system perspective. So on the first side, as you see, you know, we're going to go into the limit of how much memory the accelerators have. You know, the, you are providing HBM memory capacity and a bandwidth, we get a very high bandwidth, but the capacity is going to be limited. So at some point of time, we need to start using technology uh, solutions which allows your tier two kind of a memory for the accelerators to use, which would be required to be expanding the capacity attached to the uh, GPU or an accelerator, which may be shared with the CPU because the workload that get 
executed between CPU and GPU will continue to evolve. So we want to make sure that we have the memory capacity and a bandwidth within a node. So we call this as a node memory expansion, where we need high capacity and high bandwidth. Then we look at, uh, as we start hitting the limit of one accelerator, you are going to get more accelerators working in a kind of a, a scale up kind of a system where you're working almost like a single system where you're running a single model across multiple GPUs. You really need high bandwidth and low latency connectivity because you are making sure that you know, the work that you're doing across all of them stays connected and stays in sync. Uh, and for that, you need the high bandwidth and high latency, uh, low latency, sorry. Um, this can lead in future as we start looking into memory uh, architecture, as we look into the system interconnect architectures and we look at ways, this, ways the accelerators are evolving and the new rack architectures that we are going to see in future that you may start seeing disaggregation or some more composability of the racks where memory can get start getting separated. This is the, you know, we are already, we have seen the network getting, network providing the disaggregation of storage and compute in the past. Now it can become the opportunity for memory to make sure that we can have independent selling of compute and memory as we look into the AI use cases. Let me look at from the network side in that case. Uh, so traditional network, this is the architecture that we have, right? You have a top of the rack and you have a whole uh, hierarchy of the switches on the top, which is what we call as a front-end network, where you have access for the developers. This is where that if you're training the model, you're getting the data ingested from the storage that where you are storing the data. Uh, you're going to do pre-processing and provide it to the GPUs and accelerators to uh, train the networks or infer after that. This is, this is a very large network. This is the traditional data center network that we talked about. What's changing is basically as we start looking at the scale-up system and we said we need more high bandwidth and a low latency network, you can see that there are, these GPUs will get connected with much more higher bandwidth and low latency and what we can call this as a scale-up network, which basically stays single kind of, almost like a single um, a system kind of a view, but across multiple GPU infrastructure. So this becomes a second type of fabric in the data center, if you will. The third is basically, but that will not be enough for you to provide a kind of scale that you're trying to reach. We talked about model parallelism, we are talking about maybe 128, 256 accelerators or GPUs or to that scale. But then we, as we looked into the larger numbers, um, we are looking about maybe 32, 40, 64 or 128,000 kind of a GPUs collaborating to uh, train a single model. At that kind of time, we really need a scale out network. Again, high bandwidth, low latency, but of course, uh, it is relatively lower bandwidth can deal with it because you are going to distribute the work across much larger uh, accelerators or GPUs. So you can think that, you can see that actually what starts with the single fabric right now in the data center is already evolving into at least three types of uh, networks. You have a scale up networks and scale out networks that are being uh, brought into this. So, the systems that we talked about, we need to have something that expands the memory inside the node system that, uh, system that basically allows you to scale up with having high bandwidth and low latency and then something that goes, even scales out to the much larger set um, with the scale out networks. Some of the challenges and opportunities, um, I'm kind of a jump sh shifting the gear here to specifics now. Uh, how do we really get what we want? From node memory expansion perspective, today we are limited to what we can add with the DRAM or HBM to an accelerator. DRAM to the CPU typically and then HBM to the accelerators. If you really want to add more, uh, at some point of time you start getting um, beach front um, limited where the number of pins that you carry. So this is where CXL kind of plays a good role where you can drive it with the high speed um, serial links. Uh, however, where CXL is today, it definitely is um, lacking in the um, bandwidth as compared to what you will see in multiple uh, other solutions from this uh, service perspective, which basically means that, you know, if you run at a Gen 5 or Gen 6 speed of PCIe, uh, you need much, much higher number of service as compared to if you're running at higher bandwidth, and this becomes a challenge from integration if you think from node memory expansion perspective. Same thing is true for accelerator to accelerator or scale up interconnect. Uh, CXL kind of solution can provide you very good memory semantic. However, the challenge is going to be the speed. Uh, just to give an example, Ethernet in next few years will be running up to 224 gigabits per second lane. But if, you, if I just follow the current roadmap of CXL which goes with PCIe, we'll be at a Gen 6 at the best, which is running at going to run at 60, um, well, I think 64 gigabits per second per lane in 2026. There are other challenges that we need to fix. Uh, if we want to make these multiple systems 
or to work as a single system in a scale-up kind of environment. How are they going to share the memory? How are they going to make sure that you know, they can achieve the bandwidth that is targeted and not be limited by underlying infrastructure because the use cases were different. AI is driving these use cases much differently than the traditional use case. On a scale-out interconnect, I think we heard a little bit in the morning, and then we'll continue to have more discussion throughout the presentation, is that uh, Ethernet has done really well, and it has provided continuously growing higher bandwidth. But as we look into the um, AI use cases, to get the most out of the system, we want to make sure that we can reduce the uh, P99 latencies, because any kind of impact on those latencies can have a large impact on the AI use cases, which are training the jobs for multiple days and multiple weeks, and restarting those jobs is not certainly an uh, interesting thing to do. So congestion avoidance or congestion management, both of those are going to be important things. Ethernet has always evolved by uh, making sure that it integrates the important requirements, and I think, in general, AI is going to perhaps push for the requirements in this space a lot, too. As we look into the future, essentially we are going to see more and more composability of the system because we looked at basically five different types of use cases. We talked about recommendation for training and inference, uh, Gen AI, or the use cases for the training, uh, prefill, and decode. To make sure that we have a solution that can ad adjust the requirements for compute and memory and a network, essentially it will lead into more and more composability of the solutions for the racks as well as for the uh, solutions that get deployed at a cluster level. Um, scale-up and scale-out fabrics become part of such kind of a flexibility. Over time, it can perhaps unify, but at this point, I think the requirements seem to be uh, separating out the three different, uh, different types of network topology. Uh, memory part of the problem, I'm going to make a plug for the work that we are doing. Composable Memory Systems is a group that is working within OCP that was started last year. That group has done a uh, good progress to make sure that when we have an industry standard discussion about how do we add more memory, how do we make sure that you know, it can be composed, right? it can be brought up appropriately, um, how we test, how do we create the benchmarks for people to solve the solutions. So a lot of blueprints are being done here, and so I'm going to uh, leave you guys with that uh, call to action as a plug for the CMS. There is a uh, whole eight to five session tomorrow, almost 25 speakers speaking. A uh, lot of focus on making sure that we solve the problem for the memory as this AI systems. Uh, start driving our infrastructure requirements. That, thank you. Let me hand it off. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alex Wetmore, and I'm a technical advisor in the office of the CTO. Um, and I come from a software background, so my talk might be a little bit different. Um, over the uh, the slides we've seen today, we've seen a lot of examples of this slide. Um, and we've talked a lot about how generative AI and large language models are, are changing everything. I wanted to focus on um, how that affects the hardware, especially during inferencing. I also really like this slide, um, or this image, which shows how the operations are growing uh, hugely and um, uh, as the model sizes grow. So what have LLMs really changed? Um, the Models have gotten large enough that they're using all of the accelerator memory and more uh, for weights. And um, LLMs have also changed inferencing because they have two distinct phases with different performance characteristics. There's a prompt phase that's processing the initial um, text that's being computed. And then there's a token phase, which is producing each word. And the token phase is very uh, memory bandwidth bound, while the prompt phase is very compute bound. And I'll go in a little bit more into the details on that. Um, because the models no longer fit on a single accelerator, we have to do distributed inferencing across multiple accelerators. And this is a little bit new for inferencing. Traditionally, I've thought about inferencing as generally fitting on one accelerator and not requiring a, a high bandwidth backend network. And then um, KV caching is a unique feature in LLMs, which uh, has also changed a little bit of how you think about programming the accelerators. and. Um, adds yet another new requirement for memory space and memory bandwidth. So what is the KV cache? The um, KV cache is uh, used during the token phase and replaces a quadratic computation, which um, would be what's going on in these boxes here, if you can see where my mouse cursor is, um, with a linear computation that's based on what the previous uh, token was, and so it's replacing that computation with um, a memory lookup from the uh, prior phase. And this is very important because when we're doing token processing, we have to um, run 
every token through the every weight of the model. And if we're doing that with uh, self-attention, also doing this quadratic lookup, um, now you're doing something that'd be very compute and memory intensive. This trades it for something that is compute intensive, but even more memory, uh, or that's very memory intensive. Um, the other thing that's very interesting about having this set of prompt and token is that there's different ratios for different types of applications. So as an example, chat is very token heavy. Um, you might be giving a very small prompt and, and generating a very large number of uh, tokens. If um, summarization is much more prompt heavy, you're giving a large prompt and generally trying to produce a smaller number of tokens, or translation would be another um, example of a workload like that. And so um, batching is also necessary to get good reuse of the weights when we're doing the token processing, because otherwise the uh, everything would just be completely memory bandwidth bound where we're just loading these weights over and over again. Oh, that's an old slide. The, um, in distributed uh, inferencing, the, um, we're using model parallelism to split the workload across multiple accelerators. In this example, I'm showing two, um, but there will often be more. And the, here we're partitioning um, for weights so that we can put a fraction of the weights on each of the accelerators. And, but this introduces a new uh, communication step which takes place after the computation. And this is a blocking communication step. It's, it's very difficult to overlap this with some compute. Um, and so mem the interconnect bandwidth and latency matters a lot uh, to get good performance out of the systems. An area that I'm very excited about Sorry, this is an old slide. OK. Um, a area that I'm very excited about is uh, microscaling formats, which um, are something that we've uh, just introduced and, and announced um, as a collaboration across multiple uh, companies today. The microscaling formats allow us to do um, inferencing at uh, using int 8, int 4, or sorry, int 8, floating point 8, floating point 6, and floating point four-bit formats and get very similar um, accuracy uh, at the output. What's really advantageous about this is that um, by reducing the uh, bits from 32 bits or 16 bits down to, say, six bits, um, we're getting a multiplicative effect on the memory bandwidth, on the interconnect bandwidth, and reducing the memory requirements for um, holding weights and, and reloading weights. So unfortunately, this doesn't have the slide I wanted to show, but the slide I, sh I wanted to show um, has a very nice graph showing uh, the accuracy or the lack of accuracy degradation across um, using the microscaling formats. And uh, I highly recommend going and looking at the, um, the OCP paper that com is coming out today with um, details on the formats, how block scaling works, and um, how these can be implemented into uh, accelerators or into um, libraries and used on existing accelerators. So uh, next steps, what do we need to do um, as a, across the system? We need to be looking for ways to really improve um, both inferences per watt and inferences per dollar through things like microscaling, uh, sparsity, um, technology advancements uh, across compute, memory bandwidth, memory capacity, and interconnect. And then um, there are software uh, efficiency improvements that we need to be looking to as well across batching, sparsity, and um, in some cases, moving model, smaller models to edge accelerators to free up cloud capacity. Sorry to Alex for having the wrong slide in there. Uh, okay. You did a great job. Um, any, we could take two questions, anyone? Everyone's shy? Hmm. I see someone going to the mic. Go ahead. Great presentation, uh, good point of views. I'm just curious on to your thoughts about uh, AI at the edge and what stuff you need to do for the hardware software system solutions. Oh, for me? Um, I think that's a good question. I haven't explored that a lot um, personally because my focus has been uh, on the cloud. I think for me, there's a, there were some earlier talks about 
sort of model specialization and being able to do smaller fine-tuned models that are task specific. And I think that that's a good um, thing that can be used uh, and approached on the edge. And obviously there's a lot of work going into edge accelerators for laptops and cell phones. I, mean, I, just, I was just going to say the way I think about this is that you know it's a bit of a uh, you know like a cascading hierarchy, right? Where there are some queries which you should just solve at the edge and be done with it, and then only the ones that are serious, super serious, do you call back home, right? So, uh, so just think of it as like you know a classic memory hierarchy, except that it's uh, in this case, what can you do on the phone? What can you do at the edge? What can you do in the data center? And then you know the architecture sort of follows that. Sure, sounds good. I think uh, that was it for questions. Thank you, everyone.